Okay. Thank you. Good now. Ask so on why my revenue my rabuya. Hello audience. Once again we want to appeal to you. We want to strongly appeal to give the discussion a chance. Because any statement that is made here if it is not correctly understood, we will leave this hall carrying the wrong message. So please, we we'll ask you, as we said, all of the information that are collected here is for the purpose of rewriting the history of this nation. So it will even be to your advantage if you sit down and just take your note, other than just causing noise. You're sorry. I want to say thank you. Shall we all rise, please? I, Jonathan Emmanuel Zekbeji Buya, do solemnly swear that my statement I have come to present to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Liberia is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help me God. I'd like to use this time to welcome you to the public session of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Thank you. And at the same time to extend... <laughs> extend to you the gratitude of the Commission in positively responding to our invitation to come and join us in understanding events, circumstances, conditions of the past in the hope that this nation and this commission can establish the truth as a foundation for future national reconciliation and as a basis for us moving forward. You have been in your own right an activist, a politician, a public official, and sometimes a civil servant. Against that background, the Commission thought it was proper to invite you to share your rich experience with us and the people of Liberia as part of your patriotic contribution to the rebirth of our nation and to provide some answers to the very burning questions that have emerged since our conflict. 
At this time, I will introduce commissioners to you, following which you will see a little bit about your public life and then progress into your presentation. Commissioner Sheikh Kafuma Kone sits at the extreme right. Next to him is Commissioner Umusila, Commissioner Per Brambul. At the immediate right is Commissioner Dede Dolope. And to my left is Commissioner John Stewart. Other commissioners. Other commissioners will be joining us during the course of your discourse. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, you are most welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'm very happy to appear here before this commission to contribute in some way in finding a path to where all Liberians can unite as a nation and a people. Previous speakers before me had the opportunity to give a background of themselves. And that gave the context within which they spoke. I would like to also follow similar procedure and to give you a background of myself. I belong to two distinct group of people in Liberia. These two groups have been at loggerheads for some time, but I belong to both of them. Biologically, my father is from Riverses County. That portion of Riverses that is close to the Nimba County area. We have a close proximity to the people they call the We and Dowru people. Before 1980, they were part of Riverses. After 1980, we had no PRC people from Riverside, so they ran to Nimba. Now we heard they want to come back. My mother is from the Soroka section of Maryland County. And so I belong to the Basa ethnic group and the Gribo ethnic group. Technically speaking, I should not have had any connection with uh, Maryland County except for the fact that Firestone came to Liberia in the 1920s. And my grandfather, who, uh, who was my mother's father, John Kanga, was a cook for one of the Firestone managers in the Habel area because that area was the area of my great-grandparents who were the rulers in that area before Firestone came to Liberia. When Firestone came to Liberia, that area was taken by eminent domain by the government and given to Firestone to plant their plantation. And so our people had to be displaced they had to remove from where Rabba's field is from the cotton tree area and go back toward Basa to a place that our people renamed Kwiza. It means that the Kwi people took us from there. So my grandfather who was displaced and had to come now to work as a cook for Firestone ended up in the Kipalmas area or Maryland County area because the Firestone saw the need to expand their plantation to Maryland County. And so my grandfather went along to cook. While in the Maryland County area, he formed my grandmother in the Plebo area. And so Firestone helped to increase my tribe and to extend my family lineage, even though they took 
us from where we were. Because as our people say, Kwiza, the Kwi people took us away. That caused my mother to be born in Plebo area. My father, who came from River Says, was born of a very interesting union between a man referred to as Gadi Dito. It means a man's spear in a spear war. Gadi Dito. And a lady whose name I do not know now because my father had to leave River Sess before he was 13 years old. Because they evolve a family feud that now, almost a hundred years later, has not been resolved. And that is why I'm very interested in anything that will bring peace. Because 100 years ago or more, there was a family feud in my little village, in my father's village, that has not subsided to this day. My father comes from a place called Saya Town in Riverside, the Central Sea Chiefdom. His father had a brother called Glibo who worked on the ship. They were part of the people called the crew because anybody working on ship in those days were referred to as crew. And he went what they called down the coast, down the southwest African coast, all the time going up and down. And on one of his visits back, on one of his trip back to the village, he brought along with him a mulatto woman from the Portuguese speaking people down southwest Africa. And that woman was presented to my grandfather, Gadi Dito, as a gift from his younger brother, Glebo. And they had my father and my father's brother, Jacqui. And then there arose a dispute. This Gadi Dito, who was said to be a very boisterous man, beating up everybody that he got angry with, suspected that somebody in a nearby village was looking with lust upon his white woman because they had to consider her to be, even though she was a mulatto. But then my father was born and he was a, he was a child. And so my grandfather got very angry about the rumor that somebody in a nearby village wanted to attract his white woman and went to the village to settle the matter. When he entered the village, the people panicked because they knew his temper. And they were eating and they invited him to eat and said, after we get through eating, we can settle this matter. He said he did not want to eat with them. So they said, okay, go under the palaver hut and wait for us. When we are through eating, we will discuss the matter. My grandfather went and sat under the Palava hut and the people continued to eat and shortly after he took his seat, a gun went off and he was shot in the back and he died instantly. So the matter was never ever brought up, it was never discussed and he was just killed. That caused a beef rift in our clan and until this day, that animosity is still brewing. My father lived to be 70 years old. He loved his people very much. And I was 26 years old when he died in 1976. But until he died, he never took me to his village. I grew up in Riverses until I was 13 years old but he never took me to his village because that that whatever it is is still brewing there 
he was considered to be the son of the white woman or the mulatto woman and the other darker skinned people resented his presence as for my grandmother right after my father my grandfather was killed she committed suicide because she vowed never to get married to any of them because she knew the custom dictated that if my grandfather died then she should get married to somebody in the family and since in fact my grandfather had accused people in the family of trying to look at her with lust and she had lost her life I mean he had lost his life in the process she did not live and so my father had to be nursed by his older sister shortly after that he was sent to Monrovia and as he told me the story for a short while he lived with the David Coleman family at that time his name was Peter Coleman and so had his life not changed my last name would have been Coleman but he could not stand life in Monrovia and he ran away and went back to Riverses on his way going back to river says the boat capsized and he almost died his uncle Glibo said he would not remain in that village and that's how my father explained that he got to be taken to Kipalmas and giving to James Levi Tobias Boya to be sent to school and to be made a civilized person and so my father grew up in Hopper City, Maryland County. Later on, he went to live in Weber, where he left a very large rubber farm that I never went back to look at. I don't know who had Somebody got it now. His farm is older than me, and I'm 58 years old. I can't go look for no rubber farm now. And um, my father got married into the... Um, system in Kipalmas into the uh, settler system and um, there was some unfortunate situation that he had to get a divorce uh, because he said the, 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 the lady um, he came home and found somebody else in his bed and so he got discouraged got divorced and decided he going back to live his village life but this time he traveled to Grand Jeter County. In those days, in the 40s, Grand Jeter had a gold rush. There was a big gold rush in Grand Jeter. So you had my father, Willie Booyah, in Grand Jeter County. You had James W. Hola Sr. in Grand Jeter County. You had um, Phillips, Omen Phillips, who was in charge of the militia in Maryland County. You have the massacres in Maryland County, I mean in Grand Jeter County. So my father was among those who were prospecting for gold. And while leaving Kipalmas to go to Grand Jeter, he met my mother in Plebo and um, engaged her and married her customarily. And they traveled to Grand Jeter. And so he had his Gold Creek in a place called Kunabo. And he had a residence in ways now old Zwedru. In old Zwedru he lived in the, 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 the Muslim Madingo sector of old Zwedru among the people called the Kabas. I believe from that group you have Dr. Brahima Kaba. From that group you have the Kaba who is now secretary of the House of Representatives. And I uh, asked him one time, why did he leave the Basa and the Gribo people to live among the Madingos? And he had a very good reason because he was somebody who loved to secure his women and he had about seven of them. And he said that whenever he left his women in Zwedru to go to Kunabo to prospect for gold, he could sleep and rest in peace knowing very well that the Madingo Muslim people wouldn't touch them. He couldn't trust them with his own people. That's what he told me. So it was in that situation that my father, who had had a daughter 20 years before I was born, 
was now looking for another child. And for 20 years he had no children. None. Easter Monday, 1949, Prophetess Elizabeth Wilson of the Church of the Lord Aladura, who was living right behind the defense ministry on Benson Street. Her house is less than uh, 75 yards from the defense ministry building on Benson Street behind it. She came to my father on Easter Monday, he told me, while he was eating some potato greens and rice. And after a brief conversation, she prayed for him before they left. She got through eating some of the potato greens and said she wanted to pray for him. And she told him that he will have a child the next year. And he just laughed and laughed and laughed. And he told me, he said, my boy, the woman had eaten my potato green and rice. And I really thought she was just trying to make me feel good. So she continued to pray. And she told him, the Lord says, since you don't believe me, you not just have a child, you have a boy, and you call him Emmanuel, God with us. And he said, as far as he was concerned, the woman's stomach was full. And so she left. Right after that, all of my father's seven women was competing for this one baby boy. And my mother was the youngest among the group. And since my father's head wife, Mary, could not have children anymore, she sent for her niece, who was younger than my mother, to have this child of promise. And so my father had unto himself eight women. Then, after his eight women were securely in, under his roof, my mother had her mother there with her. And her mother went and declared that her daughter was expecting a child. And everybody said, no, it can't be. She be hanging around here all this time. Nothing happened. Because they say this thing going to happen. She won't get money from the man. So it became a big fuss. Then the younger woman also said she was expecting a child. And everybody said, oh, yeah, that, that sounds better. In the fullness of time, my mother's pregnancy developed and her sassy Gribble mother invited all the other women in the forest behind the house and told them to form a ring and they formed that ring and she told her daughter to get in the center of the ring and strip so they could see that she was pregnant. And so she did that and after that she took her daughter, cursed the other people out and went back to town with her daughter. Well, the other people didn't give up so early. They went home and circulated the news that we saw her stomach big boy full of dirty water. So that caused another problem in the place. In the fullness of time, I was born January 17, 1950. My brother was born February 22, 1950. So my father now had two sons on his hand. That created some problems in the family again because the head woman assumed that her, her son, because when you bring in somebody customarily to, to have a child for you, that child becomes your child. So the head woman assumes that her son should be this person who is the head of the family. But as God will have it, I just popped out January 17, the guy came one, uh, one month and five days later. So he couldn't claim that position. I'm telling you all this to tell you how, how I came to where I came. All that time my father was digging gold. He was not in the government. Then President Tupman visited um, what we used to be called Chen. It was not Grand Judah at that time. It was called Chen, Chen District. And when he got there for his executive council in about 51, the people went to him and said they wanted my father to be the commissioner. And he asked them why. They said because when the soldiers come to beat us up to pay taxes, he would just tell them to estimate how much we owe and he would just pay for the whole town. So he a good man wanted to be the, the commissioner. And Topman had a way of finding things out. So he sent people to my father that night to go and find out from him 
what would be his disposition if he were given a position of commissioner? My father told the people he would not be commissioner because he was making $475 U.S. every two weeks from his gold business. And he could not leave there to go and get $33.33 as .33 a district commissioner. But he was warned that when Topman gives you an offer, it's not actually an offer. It's something that you got to seriously take. So the next day, he was called to the council and declared district commissioner. Now, for people who are much younger and who do not know the history of this country and the culture of this country, we can all talk about this Congo and country thing. But I agreed to come here basically because when I leave here, I intend for our young people especially to have a different view of Liberia. That in Liberia, you don't have to be Congo, you don't have to be country, you're simply Liberian. And I'm not country. I'm not Congo, I'm Liberian. My father accepted the job, and the very next week, the president asked him whether he were in a position to entertain the president. He said, yes. He said, are you married? He said, well, he has eight women. The president said, no, I'm asking you if you are married. So he was not married in the church. And as far as the, the custom and practices were at that time, if you are not married in the church, you are not married. You are, or you are not qualified to entertain the president. So my father had to be qualified to be district commissioner. At that time, his very good friend James Holder Senior, who was also prospecting for gold in that area, had a sister from Crozierville called Trifina Brathwaite a nurse and a teacher, and she had come up to Chien to visit with Jim Holder. And it looked like uh, something happened there, and my father said that this upriver girl cooked some grand pea soup for him, and when he got through eating it, he was ready to get married. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my father got married to this good, uh, uh, they used to call him good upriver girl. And uh, he was qualified to, to entertain the president. So he told me that customarily he should have called the relatives of my mother and the other seven, seven women and asked for his diary and let them go free. But because he didn't need the money and because he, he, he was forced to let them go, so he declared them free and they made the paper that they usually make at the interior ministry declaring them free to go and get married. And so because of the need to have this government job and to have this ability to entertain the president, my mother and the other seven women had to leave. And so my father became a married man. My mother was from, my, my mother, I got two mothers, I don't call I don't call my Christopher mother my stepmother because I don't like that word step because she treated me well so she's not my stepmother. My, my biological mother left and I was two years old. I didn't know her. The next time I saw her I was graduating from sixth grade about 13 years old. So I really didn't know her. And so my mother from Christopher Trifina and in the old days all Liberians who lived in this country were used to, for 18 years were used to, or 19 years, one of the two, were used to talking about TNT, Topman and Talbot. Well, I have my own TNT in my family. My biological mother was called Tanyuna, and my other mother from uh, Crozovay was called Trifina, so I have my own TNT on my hands. And for many years, I didn't know my biological mother because my, my upriver mother took care of me. She taught me how to read, how to write, how to bake, how to cook, how to iron, how to sew, everything. Coconut tops, cakes, cornbread, anything. And she told me, she said, look, look here, she used to call me gentleman. That means gentleman now, that's upriver talk. She said, now come here, you gentleman. And when I go there, she said, you know what happened? 
Your father gave me to you, gave you to me when you were two years old. I will box you loose and make something out of you. Say so, yes, ma'am. And she had a heavy gold ring on her finger because my father was digging gold. And when she gets angry and she slaps you with her back, the back of her hand, you're in trouble. So I had to obey and I had to behave myself. I came up in a house with a Congo woman and a countryman. And they brought me up. And I must tell you, this whole debate we're having today, I started it. I heard about it when I was 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old until I got 26 years old. My father died. That debate was going on in our house. My father was made district commissioner in, in Kunambo in the a, in a, in a chain area. And because certain people high in government circles wanted the gold creek that he had, as soon as he was made commissioner, the Secretary of Interior sent him a radiogram to inform him that according to the interior regulation, he could no longer dig gold. And so he said, okay, he was acting smart by changing everything into the name of one of his relatives and said, well, now he go creek anymore. They said, okay. As soon as the president left and came back to Monrovia, they announced that he had been transferred from Chino, which is Redru, to Todi District. And in those days, that was a joining. So he was completely cut off from the Gold Creek. And that is why for many years, my father told me never go into politics because the people tricked me. They took my Gold Creek from me. So we left and went to Todi and lived in Todi. From Todi, we went to, Bopo, to, to, to Vanjima, to Kolahun, to Bopolu, before we went to River Says. I'm telling you all this because what we are discussing today, reconciliation, has to start within my own family. It has to start with, within the context of each family in Liberia. We have a deep-seated problem. Now, many of my friends who came before me are versed in political science and economics and everything. I am not versed in any of those things. I like to look at the Liberian uh, crisis from the socio-cultural point of view. Who are we and how do we get where we are? My father became the superintendent of River Says in 1956, but before then we lived in Bapulu, what is now Bapulu, but it was called Bapulu Swan District. And that is when I had my first experience with politics when I was five years old. It was June 1955. I was attending the Bopolu Government Morning School where my mother from Cruiserville was a teacher. I go to school, my mother is the teacher. I come home, she presiding over the house. I go to church, she's sweeping at the Sunday school. Everywhere I turn, she was there. So later on, when I went to seminary after the war in Washington, D.C., and they wanted to explain to me about the Holy Spirit and the nature of God, and other students were finding it difficult to understand why God could be three in one. I didn't have any understanding because my mother was in three places at all times. <laughs> she was there everywhere I went, she was there. So June 1955, the only station around in those days was ELWA. And my father had a big Grundig radio that was operated by a car battery in Bopolu. And the news came that uh, the president, Topman, had been uh, saved from death. Uh, some assassin wanted to kill him in the executive pavilion. And that uh, the fugitives were, had gone into hiding. And they were referring to the St. David Coleman issue. I was just five years old. But God moves in a mysterious way. My father was the friend of Harrison Grisby of Sino County. Harrison Grisby at that time was the Secretary of the Interior. 
or the Minister of Internal Affairs. He and my father were very friendly. So friendly that he could send his mother to us in Bopolu to spend the, 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 the season. That means she came there for June and July to spend the 26th. She wanted to go there for fresh air and all of that. While she was there with us, that is when this 1955 thing took place. I remember very well, the first song I really learned how to sing was, I have decided to follow Jesus. And she taught us that song in the Popolu Government Morning School when she was visiting there. A dump truck and another truck full of soldiers came to Popolu to arrest my father in June 1955 for the David Coleman situation. I told you before that my father had been brought to Monrovia and given to the Coleman family and his name was Peter Coleman. And for you young people who don't know about Liberia, if you want to understand Liberia, study the family system. Liberian people always trace you back to your roots. Immediately somebody could trace it back to say that guy was living with the Coleman people before. Koma is a grand zoo in the Pura Society. Buya is a member of the Pura group and he's there in Popolu Swen District. Koma had escaped. Koma went into Clay District where Supreme, our Commissioner um, Williams um, from, from Barsa, what is his first name? Charles Williams was Commissioner in Clay District. Koma went to hide in Clay District, but somebody came and told President Topman that Koma had gone to hide with my father because my father was, had links with the Koma family before. So that is why they sent a group of soldiers to arrest him. But because Mr. Harrison Grisby knew that his mother was up there spending time with my father, he, as mini, uh, Secretary of the Interior, decided that he told the President, I'm going to personally arrest him. So he came up to say he was going to arrest my father and he really didn't do him bad. He just wanted to make sure that his mother was secured and then he brought my father down. And they took him to the mansion and the president said, Buya, I know you, you're a Kipamas boy. Now you want to join the most other people against me. I heard that you're hiding Koma in the Pura bush. Now until we find Koma, you will take his place. Now you go home, you're on a house arrest until we find Koma. So that was my first experience in Liberian politics, five years old, June 1955. General Cassidy was not general at that time. He was just an, an officer, maybe captain in the armed forces. We're all living in the Busa Quarter area. And uh, my father was under house arrest, and General Cassidy came one day and told him, he said, he, they used to call each other cassava leaf. One said cassava leaf, and the other person said, it's not for good alone. And later on, my father explained to me that was a word that was used by indigenous people in the government who were encouraging each other all the time that this thing here, this power, is like a cassava leaf. Go to alone can eat it. There will come a time that we will eat it or our children will eat it. So they used to have that name. So he came and said, cassava leaf, my father said, it's not for go to alone. He said, you're free. He said, what do you mean by free? He said, the common body at the BDC, you're free. So that's how my father got free from that coma situation and we went back to Bopolu. I'm telling you all this to say that from the time I was five years old and I'm 50 and eight years old, Liberian politics has messed up with my system over and over and over. If there was a way to sue somebody to pay for all the time they have wasted, that I do not have a PhD today because of the Liberian system, I would do it. Starting from 1955, they messed with me when they, when, they, when they arrested my father and did all kinds of things. Then came another sector of the Liberian political situation that I want to explain. I'm explaining all this to tell you, so when I start to explain other things, you can know how I think. Because I, like Khan Kala, study counseling, social work, and all of that. And when you are a social worker, a counselor, a therapist, a clinician, you do not just look at something from the top. You got to dig to the bottom and start investigating from the bottom. So I'm telling you all of this so that when I, you can understand why I act 
change the way I act, why I do the way I do. All this time that evolved a debate in my house between my father who was from the indigenous group and my mother who was from the upriver group in Crozoville. Now we went to Crozoville regularly and uh, to Lemongrass Street, I think commissioners still might know all about that, to Lemongrass Street to visit the uh, Cousin Rufus Ports to visit uh, Gomalu and to visit uh, Alba Port and all the people there. So we know Crisaville very well. But I realized that there was a tension in my house when one day while my father was superintendent of River says they were supposed to go and celebrate the 26th in River says And my father got dressed to go to the occasion and it looked like he was stuck in the house. He couldn't get out. He would just walk up and down the veranda, walk into the room, walk through the living room, mumbling to himself something. You know, and then it looks like he couldn't continue any longer. He started to talk out loud. I'm fed up with this thing now. I'm fed up with this thing. Then I, I listened to him, and then he started to talk about how since, since, since 1947, when the, the uh, 100th anniversary of this country, y'all say y'all are going to turn the thing over to us. Y'all still got it. I'm fed up with this thing. We're, we're going to superintend our superintendent. I'm I fed up with this thing. So then, later on, my mother called me from Cruiserville. My Cruiserville mother called me and said, Look, Emmanuel, I said, yeah. He said, Don't listen to James. Don't listen to him. We all want people. I don't know what he's talking about. Now, by that time I was about 12 years old, and the debate started in my house between Kong, country and Congo. So she told me, don't listen to him, don't listen to him. I will bring you up the way you should have come up, you will learn something, I will find you a good upriver girl, and I will make something out of you. So yes, ma'am. So this debate continued to rage in my home, in my house. I didn't know what to think because my father told me one thing and my mother told me another thing. What I'm telling you in short is that I got an overdose of this country Congo debate long before I got to LU. By the time I got to LU, I had to calm other people down because they had just started to really experience this thing that I lived through. That I lived through all my life. Then there came, after the 55 incident, as you heard from the veteran, Mr. Coleman, the, the diplomat, there came a situation in this country that we still have here, a situation of hunting down Barclay people. There were a certain group of people called the Barclay people. We still have them in Liberia today. But I will explain what we mean by Barclay people. All the people who did not support President Tubman and all the people who joined the opposition party became known as the Barclay people. And for many years in this country, people were up and down pointing out Barclay people. I believe you heard Mr. Coleman talking about the um, PRO system. I think it was he or somebody else who talked about the PRO, Public Relations Officer System. It was a system of network in Liberia where people could report you to the president if you say anything bad about the president in a nightclub, on a football field, in your bathroom, in your kitchen, on a beach, anywhere. People were paid on a PRO payroll. And you were paid $30 a month, U.S., and you could be in any part of the country, you could still report that person to the president. And that was done by allowing you to go to the nearest government radio station. By radio station, we mean um, telex. Not telex, uh, Morse code and uh, all like that, the radiogram. If something is going on, you were attending a meeting, a church meeting or any meeting, and somebody says something bad about the old man, you could go to the radio station and say, I'm a PR agent and I need to correspond with the president. And you would just tell the president in one, on one paragraph, one page or something, what has happened and who said it and who did that. It goes straight to the mansion, to the president, and then you will find out that the president will uh, decide to 
investigate and a lot of people got in trouble. And many times people were lying on other people. And so this PR system was going on and people were calling from all over Liberia to see that during the 55 June incident this person was a Barclay person. The other person was a Barclay person. So a lot of people got psyched and got victimized because they were in the opposition independent two week party of Barclay. And today we still have Barclay people in Liberia. Who are they? From 1955 we didn't hear much about the Barclay people again when we got to 1960, to the 60s. It started to die down. Until 1968, about 68, when um, Ambassador Fumbler was arrested after the inauguration and they went to the reception the president announced that some people in his ranks were ungrateful, they were um, subversive and he would deal with them. And shortly after that Ambassador Fumbler got arrested. And then um, a lot of people associated with his group, his, his ethnic group and other friends and relatives got affected, badly affected. And that is why um, we have to understand the Liberian situation in the context of who got victimized at what time and by what means. Now, I, I was here when Dr. Fumbler spoke and people are saying, oh, he didn't say I apologize, he didn't say this, he didn't say that. As a person who has been um, working in the area of counseling therapy, I can understand Dr. Fumbler's situation. As a young man, he watched his father, who is his hero, every boy looks up to his father as a hero and he watched his father brought down from the pinnacle of diplomacy brought down to a comma criminal and sent to jail all his properties confiscated and in the mind of that young boy his dreams were dashed and if you are a good counselor and a clinician you will go back and reconstruct his life to find out that at that crucial age, before he got out of his teen age, his whole dreams were dashed. And do we know whether he ever got counseling? Do we know whether he got, ever got somebody to talk to him, to talk it out of his system? I do not know. I have not talked with him about it. Well, I assume not. Just last week, it was announced that his mother said that for 10 years, she had treated him like a stepchild. Not willingly, but because of time and circumstance. Now here is a, man, a boy whose father is in jail, he locked up, and his mother, because of circumstance, could not give him the kind of nurturing and mothering that he needed. He grows up. And we must be very glad that he did not decide to become a criminal because he would have been a very good one. He took his talents and went to school and put his whole mind into studying to become the best he could be. And I just told him just last week, I said, Dr. Formula, I respected you when I read your first book. The first book that I read of him, I don't know if that was his first book, but it's called Liberia, The Diplomacy of Prejudice. I said, I looked through that book page by page and page by page. I got to the end and I found out that you gave President Tupman a very good treatment. You did not, you are not sarcastic, you are not insulting. You treated him like nothing had happened before. And he said, yes, man, I'm an academician. I said, yes, I respect you for that. I'm telling you all of this to tell you that in Liberia we have a problem. And this problem is in every family. We have very angry children who we have not rehabilitated. These angry children are now locked up in the borders of 50 and 60 year old men, but they are still locked up there. And once in a while, this anger will burst out. All of the people who came here before I came told you stories upon stories 
about how they thought they were taking advantage of. I bless God that I was not taking advantage of per se. Because I was in the house with what they call a Congo woman and a countryman and they two had their debates and they two were trying to get my support for their sides. And I knew very well, I listened to my father, he would call me on the piazza, what you call veranda now, we call it piazza in those days. He would call me there and sit me down, start to tell me all about these Congo people and this and this and this and this. So I started to wonder, well, how come you got a Congo woman, you talking about the Congo people? Then when he leaves me alone, my mother calls me in the back there and she got some rice bread and things for me to eat. And while I'm eating, she tells me the other side of the story. So I listen to my father, but my mother who gave me the rice bread, I hear her too. <laughs> so <laughs> what I'm telling you is that I had a balanced diet of Liberian politics. I had the politics from the Congo side, the politics from the countryside. I could have grown up in this country very, very, very bad. When I say bad, I mean bad. Ahaji Kroma was my contemporary in school. Khan Kala was my contemporary in school. Khan Kala myself was in a same political party. Ahaji Kroma was in another political party. And when it comes to strategy, they all know that I don't talk, but I think and when I think, I can think you into anything, into doing anything. Kroma knows that. I, I mean, if my father had not talked to me, I would have my own army. I would have my own army. My father went through the ranks of the Chui party. And I must tell you, I'm, what we're doing today, I just gave you headlines. <laughs> because I know very well, I know very well it's almost 6 o'clock. You are tired from hearing two days of continuous uh, testimony and uh, I have been here many, many days trying to talk and you know, in your graciousness you have allowed me to start speaking today but this is not the end. My father went through the ranks of the Truy Party. When the coup occurred on April 12, 1980, I was general coordinator of the Truy Party of Liberia. I've never denied that. I will never deny that because it is a fact of history that my father from the backwoods of Riverside came up, went to school, who only managed to get his sixth grade royal reader education. And I could come and he told me, my son, the gravy that those people are cooking in the house that I can only smell. One day you will sit at the banquet table and eat. Behave yourself. Do not get involved in anything seditious. I must tell you, I have a brother called Washington. He's the guy who came February 22nd, one month and five days after I came. Washington and myself in the 70s were moved by all of the movement that were going around. And we went to my father and said, look, we want to join the army. You know, my father was such that we could discuss anything with him. So Washington and myself living in the same room, we decided, look, this thing that's not going on here, the only thing we can do is join the army, we can straighten things out. So we went to my father and said, we want to join the army. He said, who wants you in the army? You? Say yeah. He said, yeah, sit down. We sat down. He said, Washington, say yeah, you have my blessing. Go and join the army. You big mouth man, you ain't going nowhere. I said, why? He said, boy, if I tell Washington to sit down here, he will sit down there. I can come back two years, he will be sitting down there. If I tell you to sit down, you will tell me why. You want to know everything? Why? You see, in the army, you don't reason why. You do or you die. So you're not going to the army. He gave my brother Washington a blessing. He went and joined the army, the Air Reconnaissance Unit, left the university as a physics student, went to the United States, trained to fly planes, and for 35 years, he was in the army, in the Air Reconnaissance Unit. Can you imagine he flew 
the planes through the wall and he stopped flying because they shot him and he had to land a plane on a beach at BDC. But my father blessed him to join the army and for 35 years he was all right. My father told me, look, you, you're, you got big mouth, you're not going to the army. But every day I blessed him because had he not stopped me, perhaps you would never have heard of a name called Doe. Because my high hair and my temperament, everything, I was fired up in the 70s. Long before my friend Komene Wise, Dusty Wolokoli, George Clay Kier, and all these boys came to the university, I had already gone to the student affairs office and signed a paper to have the meeting, to use the auditorium to organize the movement for justice in Africa. But I don't say much about what I did or what I didn't do because I didn't stay long in Moja. I had to leave because it's in Congo and country business I enter Moja. I left and I've never mentioned anything about it until today. I left. At the University of Liberia, I organized the debating society and became the chairperson because I went to Todi Mission where there was a man called Reverend Francis Ara Ametowobla. He came from Togo. He was a minister of education in that country when there was a coup in 1958. President Topman has sent Honorable TNS Eastman there to bring in uh, the, 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 the head of, of, the, of the government in that place. At that time, he was, um, I forgot, the president of Togo at that time, he was, he was the first, that was the first coup in Africa. Olympio, Solvanus Olympio. They sent the Liberian National Airline, Airways to go and get him. They were sort of flying here. On, the night before he was supposed to come, they shot him dead. And so the education minister and other people came here in exile. And because he was a Presbyterian, he went to Todi Mission to teach. An education minister becoming a teacher of a junior high school. And my father found out that this man from Togo was at Todi Mission. And he did not allow people to wear long trousers. And you had to cut wood two times a week. And you had to water and you had to plant a cassava farm. My father said that's a place for, for, my, for, for his children. So he sent us to Todi Mission. And that man disciplined us. And there is where I learned my basic English. Good speech, good writing. I stayed there until I graduated from high school. So the coup d'etat in Africa brought Reverend Ahmed to Liberia and he became my principal. And he told me a lot of things and he organized the building society on the mission. When I came to the University of Liberia in 1970, there was no debating society on campus. It was a dead place. Mr. Kenneth Best, Charles Minor, and other people had organized the Liberia National Student Union at the universities in the 60s through the efforts of the International Union of Students. That was short-lived. President Topman banned that organization in the late 60s. And nobody ever dared to reorganize it, even in the 70s. I went to the Universal Library in the 70s and there was, it was dead. No debate, no nothing. Nothing going on. And so I decided, along with Duba Karanda, James Holman, and other people as uh, Alexander Jackson, Yvette Chesson, Victor Weeks, who came in later on, to organize a debating society to start talking about things on campus. And I was the first chairman of the debating society. We call in Dr. Sawyer, Dr. Tipote, Dr. Uh, 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 James, Lamini James, to be our advisor along with Dr. Jim Martin and other people. Out of the debating society, Fusum Simake, a professor from South Africa, was at the university teaching political science. 
He only had a bachelor degree in politics from Oxford University. But his experience was so vast that he could teach anybody. So he was teaching there. And in 19, I think it was 1973, March, he went around that campus looking for somebody who could help him to sign for the auditorium so he could show a film on campus about the Sharpville massacre. And we had a political science group, we had an economic group, we had all these groups, nobody touched him. And so I told him that as Senator of the United Nations Student Organization on campus, I will go to the Student Affairs Office and I will sign for the auditorium so that we could have these films shown. I went to the Student Affairs Office, signed for the, the space in the auditorium, and he borrowed the two films from the British Embassy at Mamba Point. And the two films that were shown in that auditorium on this 16th anniversary of the Sharpville Massacre were called The Last Grave at Dimbazi and The End of the Dialogue. Two movies were shown in the auditorium that day. And the last movie to be shown was called The End of the Dialogue. The people of South Africa were saying they were fed up with all the dialogue. It was time for action. So when that film got finished, Dr. Sawyer, who was in there with us that day, got up, went forward in front of the auditorium, and asked a question. We have seen all of this. What can we do about it? And so a discussion ensued. And all of that discussion it was suggested on that day that we form an organization that will mobilize the Liberian people in support of the liberation of Southern Africa. And what is the name of that organization? We brought all kinds of names. And before the end of that day, we decided it would be called the Movement for Justice in Africa, MOJA. And it was decided on that day that because of the nature of politics in Liberia at that time, we will operate on the same level as Amnesty International. And what do we mean by that? We will not deal with anything that has to do with Liberia. We'll organize branches in Ghana, Sierra Leone, Gambia, and other places, and we'll keep them informed about what was happening in Liberia. And then they will take up our case there and we will take up their case here. Because Amnesty International does not deal with situation in the country where the members are. People in Ghana will talk about Liberia, people in Liberia will talk about Guinea, so the, the presidents and the powers there will not deal with the people. And that was the agreement. And so Dr. Sawyer, Dr. Tipote became our sponsors. And MOJA was an organization that was organized by students of the University of Liberia because I signed the paper for the auditorium. It was no professor that knew so much book that came and just brought us together like we didn't have heads on our head. I challenge anybody to an open debate. And if they give me a chance, I can bring the documents to prove that I, Buya, signed and we organized MOJA. Shortly after that, Tipota emerged as a leader of the faculty group, and I emerged as a leader of the student group. If Mr. Dr. Tipota is gracious enough, he could show you some of the letters that were exchanged with the faculty and the president of the university complaining about the selective treatment they were giving us at the university because we were associated with Moja. But you see, I had left my home when I graduated from Tony Mission as top of the class. It was a year that the university said that all valedictorian will have a free scholarship to come to the university and you will live in the university dormitory. Charles Minor, who was recently the, Amer the, the Liberian ambassador to the United States, was dean of men at the University of Liberia when I got there in March 1970. And he 
usher me around and show me the dormitory. Simon Greenleaf Hall. And my whole self was plunged into student politics. But I had left behind me a home living in the dormitory. And as far as I was concerned, I was far above country and Congo politics. Because I've heard about that since I was a little boy. And nobody could drag me back into Congo and con country politics. Because the Congo woman who I should be hating is the one that sent me to school, who taught me how to read and write, who in 1962, when they had the first national census, bought a bicycle for me after the census, when they were auctioning the bicycle, she bought me the rally bicycle, and I was the one in Riverside riding around in the, on a bicycle. My Congo old lady. So I couldn't be against her. I'm just telling you that in Liberia we need to live together. Whether you country or Congo. If a country woman had a son and a Congo woman could take him up and bring him up and train him, then the two can live together. Later on, my, 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 when I was introduced to my mother, my biological mother, later on in life, she told me, she said, you know what happened? When all of this upheaval started to go about, about country and Congo, my country mother called me. And she said, my son, you know what happened? I said, no. She said, I don't want you to follow the country and Congo people thing. Don't be inside. Now, that my country mother talking. She said, you know why I don't want you to be inside? I said, no. She said, your father had to become district commissioner. So the queen people say he might leave us and get married to the Congo woman. He did it. I went and got married to somebody else. If I did not go, and if he didn't give it to the Congo woman, how you are you going to manage to buy my power saw? How are you going to help me to build my house if you didn't have the queen sense? She said the woman gave you queen sense, but I gave you country blood. So from today on, your name is queen sense country blood. <laughs> that was my country man talking to me. I'm telling you about the social side of our upheaval. When we just want to look at the political, the economic, the dynamics and dialectics, I don't have time for that. I came from a down the level situation where we ate cassava that was soaked in cold water overnight with some coconut in river cells and some farina to carry it down. I came to Morovia to attend the University of Liberia. For one semester I went to, for one year I went to St. Patrick High School in 1974 when I came from river cells. And I've always been fascinated by things religious. And so when I became an honor roll student at St. Peter High School, the Brother of Holy Cross offered me a scholarship to go to Zaria in Nigeria to be trained as a Brother of Holy Cross. But at that time, I didn't know anything much about girls, so I agreed. And I took the scholarship home. My father, who was lay leader in his, um, uh, lay leader in his church, said, boy, did you tell the Catholic people that I can't pay your school fees? I said, no, sir. Did you tell them you're a Catholic? I said, no, sir. Did you tell them I, I can't pay your school fees? Get that scholarship out of my house. You don't look like no Catholic. You ain't going nowhere. So the next semester, he removed me from St. Patrick High School because he didn't want me to be a Catholic. And he wanted me to have some children because he wanted some grandchildren. And he heard that the people there would not have children. So that's how my life got twisted again. But I'm telling you this to say that in Liberia we have to be very straightforward. There is no basic country Congo situation. We are so mixed up here. When the coup came, when the coup came to this country, I was in the middle of everything. I was the youngest guy in the tree party. I was general coordinator, 1980. General coordinator. I'm just giving you headlines today, tomorrow I'm bringing you documents. So I'm your coordinator. I could go to my country mind that was selling her cool ale and talk with her and leave from there and go and sit among our river girls and talk with them. So I could hear things from both sides. Both sides. So I, I'm not 
trying to downplay anything anybody has said before me. But I want to submit that this problem is not a problem of one group of people hitting the other group of people if you come, because you come from one tribe. Long before many of us were born, there was a song in this town, Roko, don't call me Roko. In the daytime, you call me Roko. In the nighttime, you call me Sweetheart. Basically because the country and the Congo people were sleeping in the night, in the day, they cussed each other out. And many people running around here now calling themselves Congos are children of country people. I know them, but I will just leave them alone. <laughs> the Congo men behave like they didn't like the country woman. They go to church, act nice, go home and everything. But every Congo man had a farm. And on Saturday, they go on their farms. They go to the small house on the farm. They lead a married woman in the big house. They go there and they have some children there. The children remain on the farm. Everybody knows. Everybody big secret. Go and check Councillor Boo, who is on the commission, may be able to, to clarify this. Check the librarian laws that are not written. Procedural law that are not written. Because of this country Congo thing where people were having children on the farm and could not bring them home and say, this is my child. There was an unwritten agreement in the librarian code of laws. Unwritten. That if I brought a child to my house, to my wife, and that child stayed in our house two years, that child is legal. My wife couldn't put the child out. Why? Because you couldn't have all the BB shot going to the court to say, This is my child. They said, But you are digging in the church. How come? <laughs> this is a fact in our Liberian history. I was Minister of Information when I went to, 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 to demand to bury uh, Honorable Baiti Moore. And I was introduced to a group of women, and they told me, These are Honorable Richard Henry's wives. And they had children there. And we executed him as a Congo man. <coughs> but those were his wives. The story is told of, 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 of Congo men who go run around with country women on the farm and leave the, 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 the civilized woman home. And the women, they always matter. So the woman doesn't want to, you know, make everything so plain that she's doing something. The man goes on the farm, send the drawer back, the fuller drawer back home. And all the woman did was to bring the fuller drawer in the house. And after some time, a lay boy appeared, just like a fuller man. <laughs> but today he has a name that comes from upriver. All kinds of things happen in this town. All kinds of things happen in this town. It's still happening in this town. And we want to pretend. Oh, who got down for that one there? Who got down for that pistol one? All kinds of things happening in this town. It happened while our grandmothers were alive. It happened while our mothers were alive. It's happening with us. A bunch of pretenders. When we went to, 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 to peace talks, all day long we fussing and fighting and doing everything. In the night, we all go to the nightclub and hang out. And then our foreign friends want to wonder what happened. I thought they were not on good terms. But these foreign people don't know us. They don't know us. They'll bring their money, we'll use it, and they will go and we'll still be doing Rocco. Don't call me Rocco. That is the social cultural reality of our Liberian situation. Of people who so brain damage that we fail to realize who we are. We have a bunch of country people that have mixed up with Congo people for more than a hundred years that we don't even know where we're going. So I don't, I don't know social, political, and I mean political, economic analysts. I like to deal with the social issues. The social issues. Then we come to another situation. 
I will tell you about a student situation. I have been a student leader in this country. I took over the student government in 1975 when the student government failed to have an election on the university campus. The president graduated. The vice president graduated. There was an interim. We didn't know what to do. Our constitution did not provide for anything to happen. And so we called a student council meeting to see how we serve this. Kroma will we soup out the all student ally party. Kroma thought he had strategy. I thought I had strategy. We went to the student council meeting. They called a meeting to order. Kroma said, uh, he, Daniel said he the Secretary General was presiding. Mr. Secretary General, I, I don't see how Buya can be part of this system because he's on probation. And since he's on probation, he should be eliminated from the system. Now, he didn't want me to be chairman. I look at Kroma and laugh. I said, boy, when you're in high school, I will tell you, you can't have met me here. I said, Mr. Kroma, here is my gray sheet. The one you got was photocopied and was doctored. Now, I challenge you to go and show that I'm on probation until you can prove that I'm in this race. We had recess. Kroma went out. Talk to his boys, came back. So he came back, he said, Oh, they're walking out. I said, Oh, really? Okay, I told all my boys, just yes, sit down. They sat down. When they walk out, I said, Mr. Secretary General, please note that when this meeting convened, we had a quorum. There no Lord, I said, after the quorum, it's my walk out, the meeting is over. So we'll continue. And the boys elected me interim chairman, the first interim chairman of the student council. The next day, Kumar filed a protest to Dr. Blamo that I had taken over the government military style and I was dictator and this and this and this. And of course, I had my boys too. So we got together and wrote a petition to Dr. Blamo. Blamo, Dr. Blamo, we want to submit that you let the law school review this case and if we violated anything, we'll step down. Toy C. Bernard, dean of the law school, sending all our papers. They sent back to say Buya is a legitimate person. By that time, Lin Su had been banned since the 60s. It was not in operation. That was why I went to 15 November Street in Czechoslovakia along with Mo James, who is now deceased. And I signed a document reorganizing the Liberian Student National Student Union in this country in 1975. When men are these so-called uh, uh, people who taking claim for everything, we're still in high school. I have the original document of reorganizing Lin Su. I have it. I'm just telling you all of this to say that in Liberia we full of organized show. <laughs> full of show. People who don't know anything about anything come up and just talk. And because the younger people do not know what happened, they just follow people. If I want to cause trouble in this place, I will really have trouble here. Because, I mean, I'm a, I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker. I think well. I want to say that that's for the students. Because of my activities at the University of Liberia, I was into the debating society. We organized Moja. From Moja, we organized the Intellectual Discourse Committee. I, Yvette Chesson, and Victor Weeks. Three persons and Siwa Kopa. We organized the Intellectual Discourse Committee. Moja is still alive. The Intellectual Discourse Committee is there. But the debate is dead. I can go through my whole life to show you all the institutions that I have to establish. They have to build this country and change things. But I told you I left Moja. By 1975, I left Moja. For good reason, because tribalism has started to creep in. And a grown man like me who had experienced tribalism in my own house from the time I was a late boy, people who think that they got so much degree want to drag me down into tribalism. I refused to go down that road with them. So I resigned. And when I resigned, they referred to me as a reactionary and all kind of nary. But if I had not organized that organization, would they have it? I was a reporter for the university spokesman. 
when Alpha Konoa was our editor and we did not print mimograph sheets where the gender ministry now is was the central printing press in Liberia. We printed a um, university spokesman that was a magazine with color, I mean not color, black and white photographs. A magazine. I still got copies. Because I know some liars will come up in the future. I just keep them and keep quiet. Keep them and keep quiet. In 1976, Dr. Kessley sent Maurice Dukele, the same Maurice Dukele, was then cadet at the Ministry of Information. Kroma was cadet there because of my activities at the University of Liberia. And at the university, I didn't wait for people to say, come and do this. I was issuing bulletin every week when I felt it was necessary. Dr. Tipote and ourselves got together and we sent a petition to the House and Senate in about 1975 to say that the House and Senate needed research assistance and that we at the University of Liberia could supply them the research assistance. My father was then in the house. The house got a document and my father sent for me straight. And he, the poor guy, he, he just did his sixth grade royal reader and so the other BA Liberia College boys, they were interpreting things for him. So he called me home, my man. I said, yeah, he said, so you say you know bo more book than me? I said, no, sir. He said, but why this thing here? You say you won't be advisor to me? I was in the government before you were born. You won't be advisor to me? I said, no, sir. He said, but then what you say? I said, you remember every time you want to write a letter, you send to call me from the university to come type your letter? He said, yeah. The only thing we are saying is that if the government agreed to what we say, every time I type your letter, they will pay me. He said, oh, that's all. I said, that's it. He said, okay. So I got his support. That was going on when Cassidy sent Maurice Dugle to call me to join the Ministry of Information. 1976, end of 1976, about November 1976. I'm going through all of this with the headlines because it is necessary for our young people to know that there is something called patience. There is something called patience. I wish somebody could pass this to the commissioners. This letter is dated September 14, 1976. That's my letter when I took my first civil service exam. Now some people think that Doe came to power and so I, I got job. When Doe came to power, I was living in a three, two room apartment on Randall Street, fully air conditioned, with a Honda car that I paid cash down for from Rasami Brother opposite convent. Why? Because I was not, I didn't have children, I was not married, and I was making 900 US dollars a month. What do a young boy with now 26 year old or something that I dream with, 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 with that? So I bought my car. That's my civil service exam when I took my exam. For every job I've held in this government, I've taken an exam except to be minister and to go into the foreign service. I'm speaking today because a lot of people have portrayed me as a dumb boy who just go around people favoring him. I'm not so dumb people. Thank God that my pa talked to me. Thank God. In 1976, this is the university yearbook for 1976. I love to keep old documents. University yearbook for 1976. The student council of the University of Liberia, and I was not in the ruling party, but the student council voted in 1976, authorizing the editor of this paper, Victor Weeks, to publish a speech that I wrote in this, in this book because of the significance of that speech. By 1976, there was a strong movement among the students that the system was not serving its purpose and there was a need for change, even violent change. 1976, people kind of say, well, you know, these boys just came out of the barracks. 
and we didn't know, we didn't know them before, and this and this. These are the headlines. Tomorrow I'll give you the detail. I'll give you the detail. This speech is entitled Productive Leadership, a Catalyst to True National Development. I'll just read excerpts from it. Not the whole thing. The student council for that. I just want to tell you where we came from, how our trouble started. It didn't start with 1979, it is 76. The student population at the University of Liberia is going through multiple transitions. From a few hundred students a few years ago to an ever escalating number of campus organizations to a number which bird, bo, uh, border the brim of 40. From little or no participation in major decisions, the students are today represented on the University Council. From the limited scope of about 10 acres of land, students are expanding their contacts across national boundaries beyond ethnic or tribal limitations and across ideological lines. From a silent, intimidated, from a silent, intimidated subculture of the 60s, the views of students are becoming the most vocal across the country. The Janus-headed, I mean the double-faced policy, which we as young people have adopted, have led us to a point where we now face a crisis of confidence. 1950s, I'm 76. When it comes to leadership, involvement, and participation in the affairs of our community or on the national scene, we are held back by the crisis concerning suspicion. We are critical of those in decision making at the national level. We brand them as backwards, unproductive, and short vision. Yet, within the confines of our 9.6 acre campus, Our student leaders display the very quality of their national counterparts. 1976. As a result, we have influenced the development of a group of students who are exclusivists. Exclusivists, apartheid thinking students. Exclusivists. They do not trust campus leadership. And therefore, hundreds have become non-participants in the life of students on campus. We are breeding a student body of silent onlookers. Slowly but firmly, the university is laying a firm foundation for the building of a society of passive, disinterested citizens. It is fostering a culture of silence where everyone is apathetic, where even the most educated will resign their rights to a handful of those who are branded as leaders. For too long, we have exiled out, we have cried out in the interest of the masses, the oppressed, the underprivileged. Yet, on this very campus, we oppose individual rights, majority group interests, and send into exile any vocal students who may pose a threat to us. The more appropriate place for productive leadership training should be the university level. We must plan a program of progressive direct action. There is eloquence in the silence of those who do not shout. They are thinking beings too. We must listen to them. To combat the crisis of confidence, we must stop hiding behind slogans and catchwords of Uhuru fanatics. 
Uhuru fanatics, those who shout empty phrases in support of liberation. The university is a system. It should never be forgotten that systems are established to serve the society. They are not totem poles to be worshipped. There is no time left for destruction because we have not built enough to start destroying. No time for hatred, for anger, for discrimination in any form or degree. We must build in hope and joy and celebration. Strive to resolve the crisis of confidence. Join Friends Fanon in rescuing the wretched of the earth. Work out new concepts and set afoot a new critically conscious student body at the University of Liberia. 1976, we were saying these things because people were there talking about destroying, destroying. And so I left the student movement, I was recruited by the government, and then all of my friends condemned me, and I laughed. I went and served the Ministry of Information in a radio and television area in a newspaper in public relations before 1979 when President Talbot saw the need to change the party and he called a meeting in Bentall October 1979 to talk about changing the structure of the Tory party to become more relevant to current day reality. I had a book called the Economic History of Liberia. Dr. D. Elwood Dunn, who was then Minister of State for Presidential Affairs, called me up and said he needed to read that book to prepare a statement for the president. He asked me to please come to Bentall that night with the book. I went there and there was a meeting of the Tui Party. I was not a member. My father was a member. By that time, I was not a member. And President Talbot came in and they sat him up on the stage. And he said, no, 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 I do not want to sit on the stage. I want to sit down with the people. So he sat down among us. And he said, we have come to a very crucial time in this country where we must make changes. This party must change. We must have a party that is national in scope and democratic in its practices. And we must start now. That was after April 14. The Brunel Commission had done its work and had recommended to the president a lot of changes. And I was a research officer on the Brunel Commission. I didn't just go through this town with my head in the sand. Everything important that was important, I tried to participate. I was a research officer at the Brandel Commission. I have the original document with my name in it. And President Tolba went on and said he was opening up the program for anybody who wanted to talk. People went there and talked and talked. And I put my hand up because my mouth always opened. I don't know why. But I put my hand up and I went up there and said, Mr. President, this is Friday night. Ordinarily, a young man like me should be in a nightclub enjoying myself. I'm here and I thank God that I'm here. Because I just want to tell you and the True Week Party people a few things. And you can ask George Bole, he was there that night. Peter Nygaard was there. Dr. Dunn was there. I do not know where... Uh, uh, Haji Kruma was. I didn't see him there, but asked all these people. I told the president in that meeting, Mr. President and Mr. Santa Barra, I just want to submit to you that this party must change or be changed. Those were my words. October 1979 in Bentall. Right away, uh, the speaker who was legal advisor to the Tui party, uh, 
Honorable Richard Henry put his hand up and I had to stop talking. And he moved to the podium and said, Mr. President, I've been in this party 40 odd years. And the thing I hear your, your precious jewel saying tonight, I never heard it before. I think it's a good thing that you're letting the young people speak up. Uh, but Mr. President, I have a call and I want you to excuse me, I want to go home. So he walked out and I continued my speech. And I told the president, I'm telling you something serious. You either change or be changed. After that meeting, when the president was setting up the 25, 27 man tax force to reform the party, he said, Who, where is that young man that was talking so much? What's his name? They called my name, put me down. I was number seven on that list to reform the party. We came to Monrovia. They called the first meeting of that group. I did not attend. After the meeting, I got a call from Dr. Dunn, D.L. Wood Dunn, to say, Emmanuel, we have selected you to be the drafting, chairman of the drafting committee to draft the final report. And I said, okay. And we had a meeting in the True Party building E.J. Roy. Emmanuel Shaw was chairman of that group. A lot of people were on that group. And we got through, going through all the country, we interviewed a lot of people, more than 3,000 persons were interviewed in all the counties. Because we wanted to have genuine change, we did not sit in Moravia here and take people from Moravia and say that they represented the counties. We sent people by air, land, and sea to every county, every territory in Liberia to interview the people and to bring tips of the interview. And then they met in Basel for the True Party uh, the, the first quadrennial conference of the True Party. That night, Mohamedou Jones, he's still alive, check him out. George Bolle is still alive, check him out. Emmanuel Shaw is still alive on Congo Town Back Road, check him out. When they got to writing everything, I had the occasion to write the last paragraph of that report. When I show it to Mohamedou Jones, he panicked. He said, Buya, we can't say this. It will not go down well. I said, Jones, we have to say it. If we don't say it, something will happen. And I convinced him, convinced Bole, and so all of us went to Shaw. Shaw said, I can't do this. I can't do this. I said, why? He said, but you know the procedure. You cannot read a document before the president unless he reads it first. You cannot preempt the gentleman. I said, that's good. I will tell you how we do it. As I told you, I'm full of strategies. So I told Shaw, I said, you know what happened? He, the president is now in Basa, in Buchanan. Tomorrow morning, you will carry all of the speech to him that we read, except the last page. Tell him we're working on it. When he read this first part, everything is all right. The message is in the last paragraph. Then you carry it to him and give it to him just before you go on stage. It'll be too late to change because there'll be no secretary there to change anything. So he said, okay. And I want to read to you that paragraph. For some people who feel that some of us were just reactionary running around the tree party trying to look for jobs. No, no, no. Before I went to the Tree Party as general coordinator, my Honda car was running up and down this time with JB77. Ask some of your grandma and maybe they were my girlfriends, you don't know. <laughs> Ask them. Some of them didn't come up. I want to read that last paragraph to you for good reason. And that last paragraph says, the records show that the 33rd convention did not share the standard bearer's conviction did not answer the call for change and did not take the opportunity to become more relevant and responsive. During this first quadrennial Congress of the party, the party now finds itself poised at the crossroads of its history. I want you to think, listen keenly. 
Because there will be many things I will tell you in a, in, in, in a, tomorrow that, that, that will come back to this thing. The party now finds itself poised at the crossroads of its history. And on the brink of a new decade, this was 79, we're going to the decade of the 80s. There is much to be done if the party is to survive. We must not only stamp out the evil, we must begin to build for 1983 and beyond. 1983 was the time we were supposed to have election. The alternatives are clear. The options are well defined. This first Congress, if it can find the wisdom and the courage, can counterpoint a revitalized two week party confidently into the turbulence and uncertainties of the 80s as an established. United Democratic Party of the people. I was just crazy writing. Or, if narrow-mindedness and short-sightedness prevail, this first Congress might well go down in history as the party's last. We hope and trust that the latter course will be avoided at all costs for the good of the party and the prosperity of the republic. Everybody thought I was crazy. But I begged them and they kept it in there and they carried it advanced copies to the president. And this was just put there just before Shaw read it. When Shaw read it, the whole Congress went into uproar. Why can they say this to us? How can these young people say this to us? The only person that came to our defense was Dr. Augusta King. He came to give a sociological and anthropological analysis of what the young people were saying at that time. That if you don't change, it will be your last Congress. They thought we were joking. They went and made some cosmetic changes. By the time we got back to Moria, in four months, everything went back to normal. In six months, the coup came. In six months after we read this document, there was a coup. And people want to make people look like, oh, you did, but that guy was reactionary with the true party people. I am on power with the party until he died. When that woman was dying, he left two symbols with me. The Liberian flag and the true party flag. And he said, boy, Work in the system. You can change things from inside. Why did he tell me that? Why did my father tell me that? Because he had worked for the party for about 40 years. And because he opposed the gambling bill along with with, 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 with uh, uh, um, uh, Cassell, who was in the house, along with Jacob Ma. And other people that oppose the gambling bill, they didn't want any gambling in this country. Because it was against the social principles of the United Methodist Church that my father was a member of. And they were threatened. And all kinds of things were done to them. Last but not the least, they were told that they were, the party would not carry them for, the, for another term of office. My father couldn't go back for the second term of office. So the party decided to go to River Cess and get somebody who lived in Morovia, who did not pay taxes in Riverses, to run against my father. Because of good situation, I will not call the person name because the children and myself are friends. So my father had support of Cottonton and university students. Roberto Doe from Cottonton, myself from the university, but other people. And they wrote a document outlining why the true party would be wrong for denying my father a second term in office. Number one, the person who you want to put there doesn't live in Riverside, they don't own property there, they don't pay taxes there, they don't do anything there. And therefore, they cannot run. When the president and the senator and the member of the party saw it, 
and they saw that the university students were supporting my old man, they got they panicked. They felt that he, uh, he had this pressure group from the university, and the university didn't have good names in those days. So then, the vice president, James Green, invited my father to come to his place on VP Road, the vice president house there. So my father took me along because I was his campaign manager. Because everywhere I went, I was always the publicity officer. I worked with the voice of BDI, the Echoes of St. Patrick's, the spokesman at the university. I was the, the public relations officer for the National Youth Council, public relations officer for the uh, uh, Federation of Liberian Youth. Everywhere I went, I was a PR officer, so I ran my father's campaign. We went there, James Green said he wanted to talk to my father. He said, who's a young man with you? I, I want to talk something serious with you. Who's a young man? Can, can he be here? My father said, yes, he's my son, and he's my campaign manager. And she, uh, the professor President Green said, okay. He said, well, Brother Buya, I just want to tell you something. As a master mason, I want to tell you something. The only thing you got to depend on is the Constitution. Because the party said they cannot carry you. They consider what you and Kiasa and Jacob Man did as being an affront to the standard bearer. Why will you all go and openly oppose the gambling bill? Therefore, you cannot go back. The only thing you can depend on is the Constitution. And I don't know how far it will carry you because you know the party. I was sitting down right there when the Vice President was telling my pa. So, the campaign continued. The agitation continued from the University in Cottonton. And it was clear that the person they wanted to carry could not be carried because it was clear that person did not live in Riverside, did not own property there, was not paying taxes there. But as I told you before, always study the family system if you want to live in this country and prosper in this country and don't get in trouble in this country, follow the family system. Know who is sleeping with who. Get to know who's tonight who's going to sleep or who. They will fuss in the street. They will cuss each other. Tonight they will be somewhere. Know those people. They went and dug my family background, my father's family background. And they found out, they remember, that in 19, after the 55 incident in the Mary Rivers Territory in 1956, Edward Fraser Bussegi, who came from Riverses, told President Topman he no longer wanted anybody from Sino or Basa to go there to be superintendent. They wanted an indigenous Riverses boy. So Topman said, okay, you can bring one. We're making superintendent. They were sure that Riverses had none. So they went to Bopolo and talked to my pa. said, want you to go be the superintendent. He said, okay. And so Bussegi took him to the mansion. When they got there, Topman said, who that, Willie? Willie is a Kipamas boy. He said, no, Mr. President, I'm not Kipamas boy. I just, I was read up in Kipamas, but I'm from Riverside. And the president laughed. He said, oh, Willie, you just want a job now. You're just talking. He said, I'm a, I'm a Riverside boy. He said, okay, Jimmy Barrow, come here. Talk Barsa to the man. And they start talking Barsa. And the president said, I swear to Moses, Willie, you fool me. <laughs> That's how he became superintendent. Bessie G recommended him and he became superintendent. So when the party wanted to put him out and they couldn't put him out be, f illegally by bringing somebody who didn't pay taxes in Riverses, the party went to Bessie's son who was superintendent of Riverses and told him he wanted to run against Buya. Now in the whole history of Riverses, Bessie cannot run against uh, Zagbaji. Zagbaji we from the north, Bessie from the south. We got a bond. We cannot oppose each other. So when they got Bessie to run against Zagbaji, my father just took all the things he had for his campaign and turned it over to Bessie He said, you know I can't fight you. So, take it over. And my father called me and told me, I was so angry. I said, this cannot be. We have won the election. I mean, we did our campaign man work and did everything. It can't be. I said, we're going to fight it. He said, no, my boy, we can't fight it. We're in his bedroom. I talked to He talked to him. I said, look, what are you talking about? Now, tomorrow, I'm putting something in the newspaper. He said, you're not putting nothing in the newspaper. 
He said, come here, come here, young man. The sun was going down. We're leaving Buse Quarter. Our, our front was toward the beach. And my father taught me a political lesson that I never forgot. He took me on the beach, on, 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 the, on the front porch with the sun going down. And with tears streaming down his eyes, he told me, he said, look at the sun. He said, you see that sun? I said, yes, sir. He said, you see how bright it is? I said, yes, sir. He said, but it got no heat. It got no heat. He said, that's me. He said, I'm 70 years old. I worked for this government 40 years. Through all the interior. At this time, they choose to treat me this way. He said, I know how you feel. But I do not want you to become bitter. He said, you remember I told you not to study politics? When I came to the Universal Library, I wanted to study political science. He said, no, you're not studying no politics. He said, you see where formula book are here now? You're not studying no politics. So he took me and put me in the College of Agriculture. And I rebelled after three years and went to study sociology. He said, I don't want you studying politics. He said, you see that sun going down? That's me. No heat. But I do not want you to fight the system. He said, I could fight back. But if I fight back, I'll be dampening your position. He said, that sun must go down to coconut plantation. So that tomorrow morning there will be a new sun coming up from behind the Capitol building. He said, you will be that new sun from the Capitol building. Unless I go down, you cannot come up. So do not fight the system. Promise me you'll never fight the system. Never join any group to fight government. And I had to promise him. And that is why my father blessed all of us. I took all my strategy and tried to read history and other things and keep calm. All my friends think I'm a coward. I'm a reactionary. But I respect what my father told me. Never fight the system. Work from inside. Improve it from inside. Never fight the system. There will always be a chance for you to make a change from inside. My mother said, don't follow this country business. Because you got queen sense and country blood. You are mixed up boy. You cannot join any country or Congo situation. Then the coup came. And we became what they call old regime people. We were truly part of people who had to go into hiding. I had to run into Basel community and go underground for about, almost two months. Why they announcing people going to jail, going to this place, going to that place. But I told you that we were very strategic when we were coming up as young men in this town. You know Willard Russell at the um, GSA? Willard Russell was one of our leaders on campus. Well, I didn't have time for much strategy. He just wanted action. When we went to the University Library, there was no fence around the mansion. We put that fence there. Because one day, Willard just told us to move and take over the mansion. And we moved there. And we took it over. And when the president came from MCSS in Sinker, he could hardly get in the yard. The next week, they started building the fence. When we were at the university, all kinds of things happened. They had a, two bookstores in this town, very good bookstores. Why am I telling you these things? To tell you the best war to fight is an intellectual war. That's why when the war came in 1990, and I was invited by many groups, I said, no, I cannot fight. My father told me never to join the army. The day I joined the army, I would die. He blessed my brother. He didn't bless me to join the army. They had two bookstores in this town. National Bookstore and Captain Bookstore. Owned by Wadi Captain, the father of Muni Captain. Those bookstores supply us books that shaped our minds. He, he had all kinds of books. I don't know why they didn't arrest him. He had all kinds of books. 
No book of killing, no murder. The political justification for assassination. Now, that was the kind of book we were reading by 77. Killing, no murder. The political justification for assassination. There was another book that Willow Guy and shared with us How to Survive a Coup d'etat. I mean, we were reading all kinds of crazy things. All kinds of crazy things. But you know what happened? That craziness paid off when the coup came in 1980. I could go to Basel Community and lecture my, my mayor candidate, Chuchu Horton, and his family about how to survive the coup. I went there and met them sitting in the living room in their chairs upright. I said, now I came to tell you how to survive the coup. From now on, nobody sit in a chair. You got a sunken living room, sit in your sunken living room on the floor. When a bullet flies through here, it will pass over your head. I don't want you sitting in every place. When well, I got through lecturing him and left and crossed over to St. Simon Church right in front of his house, a group of soldiers came in a truck. One group ran in the back, one group came in the front. And in order to scare him, somebody shot a gun in the air. And they assumed that he was shooting from inside the house. And so the people in the back started shooting, the people in the front started shooting. And he was saved because he was sitting in a sunken living room on the floor. How to survive a coup d'etat. I'm telling you all this to say that if some of us were to really be bad because of the way the system treated our fathers, we could be bad too. But when your father tells you, never fight the system. Never. No matter what happens, wait for the fullness of time. Wait for the fullness of time. And I waited. And he gave me the national flag. And I became a minister. And he gave me the party flag. And I became general coordinator. And I waited for the fullness of time. So I'm happy we are here to discuss a lot of things. Beside a true party, I was brought back to the government after the coup. And because I read that book, How to Survive a Coup d'etat, right after the coup, I wrote to the PRC turning over all government properties that were in charge of at the Chui Party because they had banned the party so all property belonged to the government. I'm glad I did that. Because shortly after that, Mr. Charles Taylor arrested me as GSA director to account for all government property in my possession. I simply gave him a letter that I had already sent to the head of state. And to back, back, when Charles Taylor was brought here in 1978, Eight to all the seventy-eight, the end of seventy-eight, by Talbot to come and inspect all the projects along with Nyon Dua Makonama and and and, 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 and and all of them. I was with the Tree Party, and I was assigned to Charles Taylor as his public relations officer because the party, like somebody said, the party was full of tricks and all kind of things. The party, well, if you call that tricks, that's fine, but the party just used their head. They see a bunch of young men come to town. They check them out. They found out that Taylor was a leader among them. So what happened? They decided they would tap into Taylor. Taylor was going to be commissioner of Artington, and they would see how he behaved, and they would bring him to town. In the meantime, Buya, you tell a uh, public relations officer. Taylor was living on Kerry Street in the Holiday Inn. I took the press people there to interview him. He introduced his wife to us, Tupi. I was his public relations officer. The people assigned me to him. Then they, when a coup happened, he came and arrested me. <laughs> I, I'm telling you all of this to say that Liberia is full of all kinds of things. There's one thing I want to say before I close down for tonight because I don't want to keep you here late and whether the commission wants us to stay long or not, I'm an old man, I need to sleep. I just want to make one correction on things that I heard sometimes this week. A few corrections. I'm not going to call it any, I'm just going to make the corrections. 
I heard that the Minister of Information went to the university campus in August during that situation there. I want to say that the Minister of Information was the Minister of Information. But I submit that I was the Assistant Minister for Public Affairs. And I took the foreign press and the local press on that campus in a truck. I got a photograph to prove. Now, I, I brought my own barber from home. I didn't want to swear on the barber. I don't know where they got it from. So I brought my own barber from home to swear. And when I swear on my own barber, I got to talk the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I took Alexander Thompson from the BBC and the other people on that campus. That just headline will deal with that later on. I will tell you what I saw there. Number two, on the day of that university incident, I was minister, assistant minister of information. I deployed the people there to go and videotape what happened. They brought the videotape back to me and I play on my widescreen TV in my office and I call Chroma. I said, Chroma, come here, come see. You see what's happening? There was a defense minister and a chief of staff on campus walking side by side. The defense minister was walking on the left. The chief of staff was walking on the right. The chief of staff had his two hands swinging. The defense minister was reloading his pistol. And I told Kroman, you see this trouble we're in? Call him, let him say, what is Lana? Two hours after that showing, I received a call from the defense ministry. Mr. Assistant Minister, you will proceed to the defense ministry immediately. You will bring along with you the man who did a videotaping on campus today. And I took the young man there with me. I got there, he said, where is the tip? I handed over the tip to the defense minister. He said, thank you very much. He called Mr. Raymond Outland who used to have one wife on his license plate. He was a PR man there. He said, you take care of this. He turned to me, Boya, I said, yes. He said, this is not for publication. In fact, you have not seen anything. You have not heard anything. Be dismissed. Boya went back to his office. I had to leave that little boy there. He was about 18 or 19 years old. The little boy came to me that evening dressed up in full military uniform. He had been inducted into the armed forces of Liberia. He had been given his rank and he was assigned to the defense ministry. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. That boy is now a man. And let me tell you one thing. I am a good journalist, whether you believe it or not. I do not let a story drop. From that day, I've been thinking about that boy. I came back and I looked for him and I found him. He's now a man. And I can bring him before the TRC to testify. He works at one of the many funeral homes in this country. I didn't say in this town. I said in this country. So you won't even know where to find him. When you call Buyat into something, you got to be ready for a straight talk. I don't have time to gamble. My Crusoeville old lady brought me up well. She said, boy, you either a man or you're a monkey. <laughs> now, if you're a man, stand up and talk. And she made me a man. I want to make another correction. Somebody said that when Mrs. Ellen Johnson Salif was uh, Deputy Minister of, 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 of Finance, they made her Minister of Finance because she was giving money to a two-week party. That's not correct. Whether she was there or not, the money was going to go anyway because that was the system. Like somebody says, such was the time, such was the condition. 
Mrs. Salif had her own times, and there will be other things I will talk about Mrs. Salif's situation tomorrow, but for now, I want to clear the air. Mrs. Salif had her own problem with the system. When I was a student at the University of Liberia in the lunch rally time, they collected money for across this country to build this country. From that rally time money, they built the medical students' dormitory at the uh, AM Doug Leoti. From that rally time money, they built a hall for women at Cottonton College called Rally Hall. They built several roads. They built all kinds of things across this country. When we went to the University of Liberia new campus on Fendel, where they were going to announce the results of the first rally, Mr. Salif was assistant minister of finance. I was seated on the front row, not on the front row, third row from the front in the university choir singing first tenor under the direction of Agnes Nibo from Bamu's Liberia's ethnomusicologist. And they call on Mr. Salif to announce the amount of money that Rally Time had realized. She got up there, and tomorrow I'll bring her photograph during that time. If you see her, you will know her. And um, she got up there and said she was pleased to announce that we raised $25 million. And everybody clapped. The Minister of Finance, Stephen Talbot, grunted something at her. She left the podium, went there, bowed her head to him, and she spoke in her ear. And she came back to the podium and said, I'm, I'm sorry, I must apologize, I made a mistake. We realize ten million dollars. Ladies, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, you defeat the purpose of this session when you behave in such a manner. Your uproar interferes with the witness's presentation. It interferes with our understanding of what he's saying and all of that. Again, we beg your indulgence. Please control your emotions. This is not a circus. This is serious business about our country. I will understand when most of us weren't around those days or we don't understand what was happening. It sounds like fun. But it's not fun. People have died. We want to avoid this from happening again. And then you are laughing. I'm very sure those who went through those trying periods are not laughing today. And they may sacrifice for our future. For you. For us. So please. This wedding is not here to make you laugh or to interrupt mm -hmm. you. Mm -mm. And we up here are not entertained at all. We want to hear, we want to listen, we want to understand. This is a very difficult task for us up here. And we call them to assist us. I beg you. We have the authority to close this session down and hear all witnesses in private. And then play the recording later on. You will stay here. We can do that. But we say no. You should be a part of the historic making process. You should be there. You should hear. You should watch the witness. Look in his face. Follow his emotions. Watch the commissioners as they ask questions. And you are privileged to be here. We are spending money that we don't have to have this in your air. Your brothers and sisters who bore the brunt of the effect of this conflict I still there in interior, they're not hearing it live as you are privileged. He wants to move it to Banga or to Zwedu, we do it. We beg you, when you come here, please support us and support the process. Respect the witness and then respect us as well. Thank you very much. Mr. Witness, I'm very sorry. I'll Thank you, me. Mr. Chairman. And I want to say that these are serious business because uh, 
All the, I, didn't know, I didn't get to know these things last night. I knew them for a long time. But I know how to keep quiet when it's time to keep quiet. I know how to talk when it's time to talk. As I was saying, Mr. Salis came back, apologized, and announced that we raised $10 million. But of course, the message was clear to us, especially university students, that she really meant to let us know that he raised $25 million. But because her boss had said to her something, she had to change it because that was the time and that was the season. I must tell you, and right after I get to telling you this, Mr. Chairman, I have to go to the restroom. Mrs. Salif called us to her house a few weeks after that. By us, I mean myself, Willard Russell, Dr. Tipote, Dr. Sawyer, Alexander Jackson, and somebody else I don't remember now. But we're all in Moja. And of course, she I do not know whether she was a real member, but I think she sympathized with Moja. So she called us to her, her mother's house. Congo Town back road. And she said, I must apologize, but I called to tell you all that I have to leave the country. So what, what happened, Ellen? She said, well, the Minister of Finance had a, a party for me. And he presented me a silver platter. And while the party was going on, he called me in the corner and told me that if I know what good for myself, I will leave this country before the shit hits the fan. And so she left this country. By then, I was assistant minister, I was assistant minister and special uh, uh, administrative assistant to the Minister of Education, Dr. Evertis Huff. When we got a letter from President Talbot to Dr. Huff, and since I was assistant minister and special assistant to the minister, I had to open the letter before Dr. Huff got it. And that letter from President Talbot stated clearly that he intended for Mr. Salif to return to Liberia to serve as deputy minister of finance. And that she had made certain stipulations which the president was directing the education minister to facilitate. Number one, that she would prefer housing near the finance ministry, preferably the penthouse on top of the ministry of education. And some other things which you will read in my book. Well, those concessions were made and she came back home to become Deputy Minister of Finance. Then the OAU came around. And there evolved a major dispute between the Minister of Finance, James T. Phillips, and a senator from Maserado County, or Representative A.B. Talbot. By that time, the government of Liberia was seeking to rent a floating ship, hotel ship, to host journalists and delegates coming to the OAU. And by that time, I had been transferred from the Ministry of Education because Dr. Huff came from the airport Robbers Field one day and told me that uh, Minister Jenkins Peel has appealed to me that he should please assign you to the Ministry of Information to help him prepare for the OAU. And I have agreed, so please, next week, go take up your assignment. So then I transferred from being a special assistant, a ministry assistant to the Minister of Education to being a special assistant to the Minister of Information. And I must tell you, as I'm telling all of our young people, my mom sold her cool ale and dry meat until she died. She never went to school. My father went to school, only stopped in the sixth grade royal reader. But my Congo old lady taught me how to read and write. And I cannot be a dumb boy. I took exam for special assistant, administrative assistant, every day, editor in chief of a new librarian newspaper, I took exam. The civil service had an exam for every position. I do not know whether the state got it. If they do not have it, I do not know why. People 
people, you know, people should start taking exam for every position they hold. That was, you see my laminated civil service letter from September, uh, from September 14, 1976. I'm keeping it laminated. What I can hammer get? Our young boys should learn how to wait and learn how to learn the raw book so they can live anywhere. The war came, I went to America, I didn't die, I didn't work in any place, clean those sick people. I went to school and got a master's degree in divinity. I was a pastor for five years. Right now, I own pension. I got my paper here to show my pension in 19, 2005 was $20,800. When I get 70 years old, they will give it to me. I don't know how much it is now. I don't want to know because it will just tease me. I left and I went to study counseling. Our young people must learn how to learn the raw book. Whether you mind selling fufu or not, it doesn't have anything to do with your brains. So I went to the Ministry of Edu Information and prepared for the OAU. And I was, I was special assistant to the Minister Peel when April 14 broke out. I was in the center of April 14. My friend Gangala was on the other side. I was on the other side. We were still friends. So I'm just giving you the headlines because tomorrow we'll discuss that. We can't go into April 14 now. But I was there when Gene Phillips and A.B. Tobin had a dispute. James T. Phillips went and got a Greek ship to come here. A.B. Tobin went and got a brand new French ship to come here. And so this competition was whether the Greeks or the French were going to win. So... We went to the organizational meeting and it was being discussed, it was never concluded, and suddenly it was announced that the Greek ship had been rewarded the contract. It means that Philip's company, or Philip's group that he was supporting, had won the contract over AB Tower Group. I'm telling you all of this to tell you what went into weakening the system. The system didn't fall because somebody from outside just pushed the system. The system fell from inside. The same with the door system, the door system was going to fall anyway. If nobody had brought war here, it would have gone downhill. And I got the story, and I'm going to tell the story. Phillips paid his people in advance for the ship. A.B. got concerned that Phillips had done something that was out of order because the whole bidding system had not gone through. So when you look in the New Liberian newspaper, in the government newspaper, there was a banner headline that Philip had received bribe for the ship. This, the, the story was carried by a guy called Afroman UO Canada. Ask Best and uh, all these all the people that were know Canada. So Peel, Minister Jenkins Peel, who was a, a Minister of Inform, uh, Information, he's still alive in America. His son works as head of the Freeport Police. Can get in contact with him and double check it. Peel went to a, 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 a cabinet meeting and came back very furious. Very furious. He came back and said, uh, 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 Buya, I said, yeah, you, you see how people won't put me in trouble? I said, what happened? He said, you saw the headline above, above, above uh, uh, Phillips? I said, yes, sir. How could they publish that kind of thing? The president is now asking me how could they publish that kind of thing about a fellow colleague in the cabinet. The president is behind me for this. So I got to get to the bottom of this. Call our Afro man here. Afro man was somebody who came from Nigeria and got and became Liberian and all like that. So you know that's a prejudice there too. So you go call our mayor Costa here. I won't call him. Costa mean people who come from down the coast. Okay, the how they used to call them. So Canada came and Peel asked him, who gave you this story? Who did this? Who did that? And Canada said, I cannot disclose my source to you. Peel said, what? He said, but Mr. Peel, you went to school, you got a master's degree in journalism, and you know we can, the journalist cannot disclose his source. Peel said, let me tell you something. This one here did no journalism in you. <laughs> You tell me who did this, or you be dismissed. So I said, Minister P, could I go and talk with him for a while? He said, yes. So I took Mr. Canada into my office, the special assistant office, and I sat him down. I said, you know what happened? We know you're not supposed to disclose your source, but there's a time for everything. There's a time for you to tell us the truth, because the president of Liberia is behind the minister, thinking that the minister is behind this thing. So who gave you this story? He said, you see the president behind it? I said, yeah, the president is concerned. He said, no, the president can't be concerned. I 
Jesus told him that. He said, oh, but A.B. brought me this story and said he passed him a public story. So he can deal with Phillips. I said, are you sure? He said, yeah. can you repeat this in front of Minister Peel? He said, yeah. So let's go by in there. Went by in the office. I said, Minister Peel, he said, yeah. I said, I want to inform you that a new librarian will stand by his story because our source is unimpeachable. He said, what do you mean by that? Then I told gave him the whole deal. He said, oh, that, that's what they want to do with me. He picked up the telephone and write a call. Mr. President, he said, yes, uh, I want to let you know that we stand by this story because our source is unimpeachable. And he put the phone down. I said, what happened? He said, the president, just put the phone down. So once you trace it back to the source, the, the whole case died. The next week, Philip resigned. And Ellen Selim was made finance minister. So Ellen Selim was not made finance minister because she gave two people the money. She was made finance minister because Phillips and A.B. had a fuss. And Phillips got the worst end of the stick. And they needed to put somebody there. And Tobo had called Ellen back and she was principal deputy in line to succession. So I just like to clear the air. That's all. I just want to also inform you as a matter of the headlines for you to keep for next time for the details that besides being special assistant to the Minister of Education, Minister of Information, I also went on to become editor-in-chief of a new Liberian newspaper under Tom Kamara, our deputy editor under Tom Kamara, who now with a new Democrat. I see you are my boss man. I used to try to cool Tom down. I said, Tom, you just came from abroad, man. You got cooled down. Tom was just the American fellow who couldn't cool down. One day, Tom came up with a big headline, the two faces of Tucson, F-A-C-E-S. On the left-hand side, he put head of state do home plus the home of all his relatives. On the right-hand side, he put the other side of Tucson that got all the rundown houses. And he talked about the two faces of Tucson. Well, I must tell you that on the last day he was editor. His editorship ended that day. He said, Buya, you take over. I said, okay. That was 1981. No, 82. 82. I 83, things have started to get bad. We had the Nimba raid. We had all kinds of raids and we had people ambush, some soldiers ambush their friends on the bombing hill road who are going to pay people uh, the battalion up there. All kinds of things were happening. Schools were starting to suffer from subsidies and all kinds of things. So I got fed up with a, a bit of it and the Tom Kamara spirit got in me. And on the first Monday in January 1983, the first week in January, 1983, Weade Koba was Assistant Minister of Information. She is alive. She right here. Go ahead. Kept all my witnesses alive. 1983, first week in January, I brought up this editorial in the New Liberia entitled, Lest We Forget. Talking about how the same reason why they overthrew the Toba government, it has started to happen again. I, was, I, I went home that night, slept well, went back to office. By about 2 o'clock, I got a call from Weade. By the time the new librarian operated from the E.J. Roy building. Got a call from Weade, Koba, assistant minister. Buya, I said, yeah, come to my office immediately. So I got in the car, went to the information ministry. I got there. She said, Buya, I said, yeah. She said, oh, oh. so what are you now? Are you a preacher or are you a journalist or what? I said, what? What can I hear like this? Lest we forget. What can I hear like this? Eh? I said, but we are what do you want me to do? The same thing that happened before happening again. I gotta warn people. I said, isn't that the same thing we talk about when we're at the university? She said, look, we are let me tell you, we're not at the university and this is no play. This is life and death here. He said, Do you know that the Minister Naga had been sent for to the mansion? And the head of state is angry about this? Okay, sit down, let, let, let Minister Naga come by, let hear what happened. I sat on the Minister Naga came back with two letters. One letter removed me from the new Liberian newspaper, another letter appointing Dapo to succeed me. That how I left the new Liberian that day. Okay. Why I'm telling you all this is because some people just think that some of us just been around here, stooges of the system. Just saying yes sir to everything. I'm not a yes sir person. 
President Doe or head of state and President Doe, because he was head of state for some time, he was president for some time. He was in office in a total of 10 years. Every year that he was in office, I was taken to him for being against him, including the last year that he died. If you call a man, I'm telling you now, people take note, there's a man called Valentine. He controlled the archives in the mansion until recently when they retired him. Go to him, let him check May 1990. The last letter they wrote to Dodo telling him against him is there. The people who wrote it, their name there. Valentine can help you find it. For 10 years, I was taken to him 10 times to say I was against him simply because I was speaking the truth. Because my mouth won't keep quiet. I was not born to keep quiet. My brother who joined the army, you can sit here down the whole day, you will not move, you will not talk, nothing. Me, I got to talk. I got to talk. I got to say what I got to say. In college, I Daniel City who now were with Yenabo. My nickname in college was Views. Because I always say I got to express my views. I got to express my views. I got to talk. When Elizabeth Collins, who was senator from Bond County, went and slapped my roommate, uh, 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 Morgan, I forget, he died in the, during the war, um, Ernest Morgan, slapped him with her, with her finger ring and cut his face. I issued a bulletin here on the Senate, charging them with misuse of authority. And the last paragraph said, when people misuse the authority vested in them, the power must return to the people. All of this happened long before 1980. So what I want to tell you is that everybody in this town got a story to tell. Not just one group. And the last thing I want to say before we go tonight is this. I do not want our young people to feel that one group of people in this country were talking against the, the, the bad in this country. It's not true. For all you hear, it will look like only indigenous people were talking against the bad and all the Congo people were involved in the bad so the, their children were not talking. That's not true. The revolution started with Congo children. I repeat, the revolution started with Congo children. Do you remember Victoria A. Jesus Weeks? The brother of Kimmy Weeks? He published in this country the first really vibrant opposition paper called the Revelation Magazine. Here is a copy of the Revelation Magazine. The Revelation Magazine. Victor Weeks, his father was Minister of Foreign Affairs when he was publishing this thing against the government. So if we want to be revolutionaries and want to talk the truth, we should not make it look like just country children being talking. The Congo children talk too. Victor Weeks' uncle had a problem with Stephen Talbot, Mesorado, and Oreo group of companies. That's why Abapo had to write a pamphlet called Liberalization or Goblin Businesses. Why would people who know the truth want to just show one side of this thing? Now, I, I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm, a, I'm, I'm called Queen Sense Country Blood. So I'm now an NSI I got to stand in the center of the room and remind people. Victor Weiss went to jail. The Congo system put him in jail for joining country people to oppose the government. He went to jail in this country. After the Revelation magazine came the Revolution magazine from the back of Matthew and his group. After the magazine came the Tribulation magazine. After the Tribulation magazine, then the PRC had the Redemption magazine. So you see all the theological themes we had in our struggle, the revolution, the, re the, the revelation, the revolution, the tribulation, the redemption. Why you want to forget? Why, why do we forget or do we intend to just show this thing that only the country puts you are doing something? Now I'm a country woman child. I'm a man child and son. But I'm not going to be intellectually dishonest to just show that only, only, only country people are doing this thing. A lot of Congo people suffer this thing. ST, ST Riches had a printing press in this town. He opposed President Tupman. Said President Tupman should not get married to the woman he was married to before he died. 
Quiet. You go in there, the, 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 the American boys were on, 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 the, on the airport there. They were the young girls in town. And S.C. Richards said, you cannot marry this woman. The next morning, he got out here, the printing press had disappeared. And the rumor is that he got dumped in the mud right the river. A Congo man from other river. Why do we want to make this thing look this way? That as if only the country children being talking about the thing the Congo children be doing. I don't want to say... I am Queen Sense country blood and I'm an NSI. So you know me now. You having your Congo meeting, don't call me. You having your country meeting, don't call me. You having your librarian meeting, I will be there. I'm tired of the foolishness in this country. I want to make everything look one sided. Country Congo, country Congo. Or, or, uh, the Irish country man won't marry a Congo girl. The Irish Congo woman lusting after a countryman and won't make it look like something. I am the one who going to stand in the center like Joshua and command the moon and the sun to stand still until we solve this problem. I think I'll talk enough for tonight. I'm tired. I need to go to sleep. Hey, you want to ask me a question? You can start. I'm, I'm tired of talking, so I can answer questions. Mr. Witness? Yes, sir. We control our time, please. Okay, I'm saying I'm tired of talking. All I've given you were the headlines. So I'm tired with the headlines. So if you want to ask me questions, I can talk, I can answer them, but I cannot talk anymore because my time for talking ran out. I know you control the time. I will talk if you ask me questions, but I don't want to say any more of my... Oh, I'll give you a headline. I don't go into detail yet. I haven't told you how I was working in the, in the, in the, in the foreign service in Washington, D.C. For 10 months, we had no ambassador, and I had to be in contact with the American government. I haven't told you how the American government was looking for somebody to succeed, though, and they called me to the State Department to talk about it. I haven't told you anything yet, young man. Okay, Mr. Witness. <clears throat> Mr. Witness? Yes, sir. We understand you are tired and we respect that. Yeah, I'm an old man. I'm 58. I understand. Thank you. So we'll resume tomorrow morning with questioning. Thank you very much. No, I will have to talk a little bit before you question me. No, during the question, you can bring out. Oh, that's those. good. Thank you yeah, very much. Well, okay.